Welcome back to Kevin Pollock's chat show. I, I am, as always, chat show. How the hell are you? I'm waiting for an answer. Thank you for writing to us at kpcsfanmail at gmail.com and letting me know how you are. Many of your emails, a few of which I will read today, begin with answering that question because I like to start shows as a smartass. And I will say what I just said, waiting for an answer. And here in the studio, there never is one. So thank you for writing to us at kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. Uh, and starting your emails with, fine, fuckhead, I'm fine. Um, if I sound a little different uh, in, in any way, I thought I would bring attention to it in, instead of you hearing it during the interview and thinking, did he have a tooth pulled? <laughs> and now there's a space <laughs> where sometimes his tongue falls into while he's talking. It's true. That is the sound you hear. I have a little flipper that I could wear. It's like a, um, I guess if you had a retainer, so there's like the little flesh-colored thing that goes into the roof of your mouth and attached to it instead of a, a wire that would be a retainer. I've got a little tooth, and they call it a flipper because it looks like a flipper <laughs> attached to the roof of your mouthpiece. Now, this is a theater of the mind. I hope you're enjoying it. So I could put that in, but it doesn't quite rest flush against the roof of my mouth. So it turns me into this guy who talks like this. So I thought <laughs> even if the wind blows through this hole in my uh teeth this space that's been created by pliers um it's better than the lispy version of me i think well write to us and let me know kpcs fan mail at <laughs> gmail.com for those of you who give a good goddamn about the marvelous mrs mazel i attended a guild screening of the first two episodes of season two uh just a few days ago and uh, in a large movie theater with an audience and um it's not only amazing to see it like that but hearing the audience you know uh, not just seeing it on a big screen, but hearing the audience hanging on every word and laughing when we wanted them to, but as a group of strangers who'd never met before in this particular capacity. They they hadn't rehearsed uh, the way the actors had on screen as an audience. Um, and also just loving all the little nuances that uh, you have no idea what people think as they're watching it, unless you happen to be fortunate to gather in a movie theater, which we'll talk to our guest today about because she's been screening her her new film that she wrote, directed, and started. Um, it's a it's a it's a whole other experience. And as uh, creative people, you know, you're especially if you're creating for, let's say, television. Even though it's 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 all bigger than that with the various streaming portals. Um, you have no idea <laughs> what people think <laughs> as they're watching it. Sure, they can write about it. And man, oh man, do people have too many fucking opinions now with the internet. Thank you all for having an opinion and the ability to state it for the public at large to read. Um, but uh, you, we just don't know what it's like in that theater experience. And so I'm, I'm really happy to report that the first two episodes, anyways, of the new season <laughs> of The Marvelous Mrs. May will play like gangbusters. Um, you won't have much longer to wait. The whole season two drops on Amazon Prime December 5th, which is remarkable that it, it's only a year and a week from our debut. And people say, well, why do I have to wait a year? That's my impression of all of you, um, <laughs> you fucking whiners. But here's the deal. When you when you do a show like this that, that doesn't have to answer to ads, so it's not just not 48 minutes is all you're getting commercial television. It's not even not just 60 minutes. So the episodes are coming in around 70 to 75 minutes. Which means there are 10 episodes, that's 10 70-minute movies that have to be shot starting in March and then post-produced to be released on December 5th. When you look at it in those terms, from March to December, 10 70-minute movies, we'll talk to our guest today. She can help <laughs> echo just how fucking insane of a schedule that is. So it's kind of a miracle that they're all dropping. Instead of what you think, which is, why do I have to wait a year? Um I'll work on my impression of you, the collective <laughs> you, because that is pretty fucking lame. I'm sorry. Um, let's read a couple of your emails just because I threatened to. Uh, a couple. Uh, I can't keep up. So this first one speaks to that that very problem that I. It's impossible to keep up with the emails. Uh, please keep writing. Don't give up. And thank you for writing. There's too many of you who are writing. Hello. This one begins. My name is Rich Johnson. See right away. 
I have my suspicions. Rich Johnson, <laughs> really? That's a fucking name and you're going to stick with it? He continues, and I am a theater teacher in upstate New York. Currently, we're in the middle of producing the play A Few Good Men. And then he, in parentheses, got permission to gender switch roles so we had more for the girls. Still calling them girls, though, aren't you, Rich Johnson? <laughs> Uh, end quote, end of a parenthesis. And always like to do something special for them on opening night. With Mr. Pollock, I guess this person assumes, Rich Johnson assumes I'll never read this. With Mr. Pollock playing Sam Weinberg in the film version of A Few Good Men, I was wondering, again, back to parentheses, if this message is able to get to him. I was wondering if he wouldn't mind recording a quick video clip of himself wishing the cast at the Albany Academies. Academies, hmm. break a leg. Uh, I know this is extremely an extremely long shot, but I figure nothing ventured, nothing gained. These kids are really working hard, and this would be such a treat for them. If it's not possible, no worries, and thank you for taking the time to read my email. Sincerely, Rich Johnson, still not believing that's your name, and the play runs November 2nd and 3rd. So I'm reading this November 5th, so already will you see the problem. <laughs> Um, I am still going to record a video. I just read this email last night. And, and instead of saying break a leg, I'm going to say, great job, you guys. And by guys, I mean all genders. Uh, just to give you listeners a preview of that exciting video that none of you will see. Except for Rich Johnson, and that's not his name. Letter number two. Hi, Chat Show folks. I can't remember which show I listened to, but it was the first one where I heard you recommend the TV show Patriot. <clears throat> and I watched, and all caps, loved it. End of all caps. I just listened to your interview with Kurtwood Smith, and you mentioned things I don't remember, so I'll watch it again before season two. Thanks for the recommendation. Kurtwood Smith plays the villain on the show. Uh, season two for them drops this weekend, November 9th. Uh, which is also a very important day to our guest today, so I'll stop talking about this other thing. <laughs> um, that letter was from Lisa Nelson, SW Florida. I'm hoping that's Southwest. SW Florida. I love Florida. It's such a great state. Some people are their own parents there. <laughs> I'm not saying it necessarily in the SW portion. Probably. <laughs> probably in the SW portion. Um, all right, one more because it's a short one. Dear Chacho, how are you? I have enjoyed the addition of the Ask Kevin segment being extended to the guest. However, I guess that was a spoiler alert for my guest today. However, after the guests ask their question, I often wonder if your first thought is, in quotes, well, I see you haven't read my book, end quotes. I guess the snark here from Anthony Rome is that I offer the guests an opportunity to ask me a question. And when they ask the question, if the answer to it is in the book I wrote, I'm thinking while they're answering, you fuck, you didn't read my book. <laughs> Anthony Rome, buddy. Wow. That's so hilarious. <laughs> Unintentionally, uh, the letter continues. I apologize if it seems like a self-congratulatory implication that I have indeed read your book, How I Slept My Way to the Middle. Not just a funny title and technically still available on Amazon. <laughs> That's not the rest of the title. However, I invite you to round out the self-congratulations with a nice plug for that excellent publication. Well, aren't you sweet? And yes, of course, that's why I read your email. Uh, <laughs> thank you for writing to kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. Uh, thanks awfully, Anthony Rome writes. I'm pretty sure I know what I may do now. Getting out of your face, comma, Anthony Rome. Yep, it's just that simple. That's how you write to us. That's how they get read. And thank you for doing so. Damn it. Um, I can put our guest in purgatory no longer. Uh, I'm very excited for this moment. Um, my guest today is making a lot of people sit up and take notice to a new exciting filmmaker. Actually, she not only wrote and directed this new indie comedy called Les Bomb, she pulls off the impossible task of also portraying the central character. Please welcome Jenna Lorenzo. Hi, Kevin. How are you? It's good to be here. It's good to see you. <laughs> it's good to see you on this other coast. Yeah. I've only seen you on the other coast. Yeah. 
specifically New Jersey or New York. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I like the weather here better. Do you? Yeah, a lot better. It's my favorite thing that New Yorkers comment on about. Yeah, just the weather. Yep, that's it. Period, the end of That's it. all you've got out here, <laughs> weather and traffic. Um, so you, uh, how, you're here for how long? A week this time? Less than I a week? Was, I was here like two weeks this time. And then, mm. yeah, I feel like I've been here more than I've been there in the last like two months. And how's that feel? Uh, it feels like I'm going to have to move and I'm going to have to talk my wife into doing it. And I uh-huh. don't know how. You don't know how. I don't know how. She's a she's a firm no right now. <laughs> On moving to California? Yeah. And you just kept talking about the weather and, and she I, keeps and saying I, I, keep I know. And pictures of the view. Maybe and, bring her out here in February. Yeah. And then go home. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that'll have a little more impact weather-wise. Instagram, I'm never leaving and she's just not getting the hint. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, there's only one way to, you know, as a poker player, mm. you got to live that bluff. Yeah, I know. You got to not go home. Yeah, I. that's what I said. I said, come January, I'm gone. <laughs> With or without you. And yeah. she's like, okay. Under the guise of, I'm moving for show business, really? Right. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, you give me a firm, definitive, I have to be there, a reason, and I will come. And I'm like, oh. Well, Janice, you opened that door. I know. Now it's like. You got to walk through it. I'm ba- Yeah, I'm basically just like telling everyone, just give me a job. <laughs> and then I have to move here. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, that's not how it works. Yeah, I know. It's, I, I wouldn't. Have, it would be so wonderful. You have a calling card. <laughs> yeah. And let's talk about it. Yes. I mean, the hardest thing now that not only does everyone have an opinion, but thanks to the last 10 years of YouTube saying, you can be right. a writer, director, we have a portal for you. Mm-hmm. Um, so many more people are a writer, director. Right. And then the most difficult thing becomes... How do you let people know you've written and directed something? (laughs) Like I just launched this new comedy podcast and like four weeks ago, I just got a bunch of brilliant improvisers together and I'm like the puppet master and we sit down and I present them with ridiculously bizarre, stupid scenarios. Mm -hmm. And then these five fearless, fast, uh, brilliant improvisers create Magic. Mm-hmm. It's called Alchemy This, yeah, actually. Yeah. They create alchemy. Um, and we just launched, you know, like four weeks ago. And the only way to let people know was Twitter and Instagram. Right. Right? Yeah. And so we're in this vacuum of, does anyone give a shit? Right. And today, after only four episodes, and no push beyond our Twitter accounts and our Instagram accounts, <laughs> we just broke the top 200 on, on iTunes of podcasts, which now there That's are three, 300,000 podcasts. Wow. So the fact that you break the top 200 <laughs> is weirdly a big <laughs> fucking deal. Then under the com- – that's all podcasts. Yeah. Under the comedy category, which is clearly where, where we care about the most mm. – we just hit number 15. Oh, that, that's That's, that's monstrous. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, for something brand new. Yeah. So again, um, it's a miracle that anyone found out about it, right? Right. A lot of people push, 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 push using social media, but still the noise yeah. you have to push through to let people find out what has been, let's talk about that part of your process and journey first, and then we'll go back to the origin story. Well, yeah, actually I had that. Well, I thought a lot about that before making the movie because like the, the market's so oversaturated with content. And I was like, but, but there's like a wide open gap for a lesbian holiday comedy rom-com with a happy ending. <laughs> I was like, it's just like, doesn't exist. And right. like, as someone who had to come out, like I searched hard for just a happy ending sure. you know sure. and like and there was like a maybe like a few and like sometimes they were funny but i was like okay so we have that <laughs> a happy ending a comedy within that space let's like go with that and thanksgiving and th- and like and everybody family likes, gathering you know, so many vegetarian jokes that were yet to be untapped <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah yeah so um but yeah like cutting through the noise is like it's really hard. Also, you've been on a film festival tour. Right. Um, by your own design and others inviting. Yeah. How does that happen um, for any filmmakers out there who who also want to break through the noise? Do you have to beat down every door or do you get invites as well? So, like, figuring out where to premiere the film is always, like, a headache in itself. Because, like, everybody's sort of clamoring over, like... Sundance, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like, oh, if if 
like that would be amazing to get in. But if, then I remember like advice given to me was like, you want to be mindful about where you get in because if it's a, a festival, maybe as big as that, it's a place that you might get lost. Mm. Um, or tonally, it might not be the right mix. Yeah. And we were very fortunate. A few like mentors of mine had, had kept saying Bentonville. And I was like, like Arkansas? Um, and it, But it happened like three times, like back to back. And I was like, that, I, I maybe. And then when we got in there and like I've, I mean, a league of their own, like really sort of the movie that made me want to make movies. So it seemed kind of like, all the right stars aligning. So what was the connection to? Well, cause it's Gina Davis's festival. Okay. And I was like, I just feel like if, <laughs> in my head, I was like, if we go to Bentonville, I'm leaving their best friends with Gina Davis. Like that in my head, that was like bottom line. Yeah. I was like bottom line. Yeah. Not a bad takeaway yeah. <laughs> as takeaways go from experience. Right. Yeah. So when we premiered there and I did get to drink with her, I was Hello. like, this is everything I've always wanted. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk a league of their own. Yes. And and you peppered her with questions. <laughs> yeah. And she's like, I'd love to work with you. I was like, can we just get a napkin so she can write that down? I need that sign. in writing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had John Favre on the show years ago, and he talked about how swingers did not get into Sundance. And it was the greatest setback right. of the process. Because, you know, it is the journey. And people tend to put these um, goal steps at a higher level of import right. in the journey. And when he was turned, that film of his, what he went through to get it made, mm -hmm. what he went through to get it cast, what he went through to shoot it um, was, you know, that alone was this Herculean task that seemed impossible right. 37 times. And then you finally get to submitting it and everyone's seeing it saying, this is it, this is it, this is it, you're going to get in. And then not. Right. The devastation of that um, seems like the end of the world. Yeah, for sure. And it wasn't until he was able to set up a few screenings back in Los Angeles that a big, you know, studio saw it and bought it. So uh, there is no correct path. Yeah, and I think that's been like such a important lesson. I mean, in life in general, but on like on this like les bomb journey, like every time something seems like it's the end of the world, it usually leads to something so much greater. Yes. Yeah. yeah a garage door. <laughs> opens after a window closes. Yeah. It's weird. Absolutely. Like there were so many times and my wife always calls me out on it because it to, to it never fails. Like I feel like it's the end of the world. And then like an hour later a seeming miracle happens and she's like, "Can we just remember that last time it was the yeah. end of the world?" An hour ago. Yeah. It was <laughs> Everyone's dying. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, never. And I'm like, this is it. This is it. I mean, this is what it means. And she's like, does it? Because every time you get like really down and I, and there's this weird thing because I've always been and my manager commented this recently, like when someone says like no or it's something's impossible, it is a, a lot of fuel for me. Mm. Like it, 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 I work better in the in that context. Right. Right. Well, that's pretty great, though. And also, you're not alone mm -hmm. in those feelings as an artist. Uh, the sky is falling. Right. Befalls most artists right. in terms of, well, that didn't work out. Right. <laughs> um, I was at a, a life-altering two-week period in 1991. Um, I screen tested for this movie against another actor, just the two of us. And I'm going to tell you the background first, because if I tell you the name of the movie and the actor, you'll instantly get a different idea of, <laughs> Kevin, you never had a chance at getting this part. But if you read the script, it was very sort of younger Albert Brooks, sort of me mm. in that way, in terms of what I can do and what I physically represent. Jewish mama's boy, you know, on his mother's deathbed, he promises to accomplish something. And so it went up, me and this, this actor who is a sort of bigger than life movie star. And, you know, my feeling was, well, of course the studio wants him. And the director kept saying, yeah, but I want you. You're the you're prototype mm. when I wrote the script. I didn't know who you were when I wrote the script, 
but now that you've come in and auditioned, <laughs> you're fucking perfect for this. And he really fought. And ultimately, the studio won out, won outright. And Nick Cage starred in Honeymoon in Vegas. Ah. And my life was shattered beyond anything I'd experienced in terms of getting that far. Right. To star in a movie uh, was impossible. And I got that close to it. And the sort of the world is over was fully realized. Mm -hmm. Two weeks to the day, I get a few good men. Oh, my God. Now, as amazing as it would have been to star in Honeymoon in Vegas... It would have been obviously a whole different movie because Nick Cage is so brilliantly funny and wacky in that fucking film. The movie made $9. And A Few Good Men became this international yeah. juggernaut that changed the course of my life. For sure. So there, a window closed and a building opened up. I, I love that story. It, it, well, I mentioned it simply because it's, it is that same sense of how close I came, how close we all can come. Fail. And when younger actors or whatever ask me about, you know, I tested for this pilot, I didn't get it. You tested to star in a pilot. Yeah. Do you know how hard that is? I mean, truly mm -hmm. ridiculous. Right. <laughs> so when you start applying for film festivals, um, the idea of you got to get into Sundance, you got to get into Sundance. Do you, in fact, apply? Yeah, totally. Yeah. And then try to like reach out to anyone under the sun. And then also like neurotically, like I felt that the whole journey, I was like, is it like the Vimeo link tells you when people are watching it. And so I'm always like, I'm not seeing any motion on the Vimeo. Yeah, like, you're telling and, you know, me you watched it. <laughs> or, you know, and like we, um, and like, so we just made sure pe somebody or somewhere was watching it. And, right. um, and you just like try to get it in front of as many eyes as possible with or without luck. Um, and so when Sundance didn't work out, I was like, my life is over. But then like, it wasn't. <laughs> you know, it just like wasn't. Yeah. And I remember my impact producer on this, Matt, he's doing all of our digital marketing stuff. He's like, thank God we premiered at Bentonville because we won. And like that came with its own set of things that wouldn't have happened if we had premiered at other festivals. Yeah. So it did seem like. You're award-winning filmmaker. Right. Thank you, Bentonville. <laughs> thank you, Bentonville. Fuck you, Sundance. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Totally. Yeah. I yeah. mean, that. It, it has changed. One of the, uh, I would say the best part about uh, getting into Sundance was the uh, director's breakfast with Redford. And Redford speaks to the gathered directors. Mm. And um, he really talks about, there was never a festival. It was a institute to uh, gather young filmmaking writers, directors. And then they would bring actors who want basically to be in a student film. Yeah. And that's all it was ever meant to be. And in fact, the only reason a festival started, it was just one theater. And the, he went into town and said, would you mind if I show some of these students films? And that was the birth of it. And it was just, it wasn't about distribution. Right. It wasn't about any of the circus. It was, I would like these students to be able to come into town one night, 40 minutes away from the Institute. Mm-hmm. And just see their short film on a screen, you're right? Um, and it was the the rawness and the sort of uh, genuine quality of an institute that was nurturing mm. talent. And it was just about that. Right. Let's all get a little better at this. Let's learn how to do it and so on. Become better storytellers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, where the hell... Did you get that nurturing as a young filmmaker? It has to come from somewhere. Yeah. You know, I like, so I was interested in movies at a young age. And then when I was a senior in high school, I was the annoying kid with the video camera that was documenting everything, even mm. if you didn't want to be documented. Right. Um, and so I started to fall in love with 
the, actually the editing process with that because I, fa I found it so like edit on this person's motion or this. And so I had 35 hours of unedited film that my, my, my best friends are so terrified of that surfacing one day and cutting it down <laughs> to a two hour DVD uh, that I like played and my, my parents let me have a party and I like premiered it. Sure. And, um, and so I fell in love with that process at that point. And then I went to Carnegie Mellon and after um, I realized I was never going to be a psychiatrist. I decided to do writing and directing and sophomore year switched into that program. At Carnegie Mellon. Yeah. Extraordinary. And studied writing and directing and then some acting there. Um, so you have teachers and you have uh, yeah. mentors? Yeah, mentors and teachers. I feel like that's – and like and also feedback from people. I've always been interested in – uh, I've always been really inquisitive of oh, what is working, why, and trying to listen if it's like um, a taste thing or if what I'm trying to do is not landing, if my intention's not landing. Right. And trying to differentiate between like someone being like, oh, I just don't like this flavor. You right. Know? <laughs> right. Um, and also with at CMU um, in the writing program, uh, the teachers, we were graded on our ability to take and give criticism which was also very helpful yeah with as like just learning to be a filmmaker and then speak it about it in a language that filmmakers understand as opposed to the worst thing about the internet is that everyone has an opinion right and man oh man are they meaningless because they're not from students of the art form Right. They're just from people with opinions, right. which we're all entitled to. Yeah. But shut the fuck up about it. Right. <laughs> right. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> what anyone thinks unless they're doing this. That's the thing I never understood. Even as a young stand up comedian, there'd be a review. Right. Um, and I would think, you know, critics should really just sh give us directions to the theater. Right. <laughs> if you want to be informative. Yeah. If you want to help somebody out. <laughs> How could your single opinion, right? Right. But when you hear it from a critic who was who wrote essays, yeah, right. They always talk about Janet Maslin, wrote these brilliant essays. Clearly, this is a student of the art form mm -hmm. who is learned as well. So you're getting mentors and teachers. Yeah, I actually met one of my greatest mentors when I was waiting tables. Um, Keep talking. <laughs> yeah, I was waiting. I think the place was called Le Leon or something. They changed the name of it. It was a French place in the East Village. And I was, there's this woman who's like writing a script. And I was like, I'm writing a script. And she's like, I was amused. And she's like, what are you writing? I was like, a web series. And she's like, okay, well, yeah, you yeah, know, I write too. And she gives me this like handwritten card. She takes like a piece of paper and writes her information on it. And she's like, well, if you ever need help or something. And she hands it to me and I put it in my like apron. And a week later I look her up and she is an executive producer on the L word. Shut was, up. I swear to God, it was Rose Roche. And she, for the last 10 years, has like given me – advice and entertained all my emails that's redonkulous yeah and we've sat together and she watched les bomb and she gave me her thoughts um and she watched girl night stand which is the short that i had that had went viral which is how i got the financing for les bomb and when i had made the short and showed it to her she just um encouraged me to keep asking myself how i wanted to push the lgbtq narrative forward and like join the tradition but in a way that like we hadn't seen before. Mm. Um, and so she became a mentor of mine. So I've, a few mentors I've actually met when I was waiting tables. What are the other, who are the other ones? Um, his name's Rohit Sang. He is sure. now, he's at um, True TV. <laughs> and he, um, he taught me how to pitch and like go. Huge to a, part of the business. Yeah. That he, no one teaches you. Yeah. He was like, never go into a room and sell. He's like, always go in and make a best friend. Wow. <laughs> what an amazing piece of advice. Yeah. Extraordinary, actually. Yeah. It was so, he was like, fine. He's like, just connect with the person. Don't worry about talking about any projects. And then one day, the two of you will find a project that will come together. Because if you're connecting on a personal level, you know, you learn what themes are important to that person. Yes. You know? Way more important. Which is like, because you can spend, you can spend all the time in the world coming out here and going to meeting after meeting to meeting. But like if you 
if I'm like interested in romantic comedies with a happy ending, I'm definitely not making the next Pearl Harbor that is like a, a period piece or, you know, at this moment in time. Man, do we need another Pearl Harbor though? <laughs> wow. For those of you listening out there, if you have a script, please send it to kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. But it has to be about Pearl Harbor. Um, wow. What an amazing piece of advice. Yeah, that was great advice. And this trip out here, are you in fact taking these pitch meetings? I, I, I've been like really specific. And um, I've also, even with like the, the acting thing where I, they're like, well, what would you be interested in? I'm like very specific. Something that gives me an opportunity to train as a samurai. Maybe. <laughs> as part of the job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was like. Even if it's a sushi chef? Yeah. I'm like, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. Um, I don't know if they're making like a soccer movie, like. I'd be down for that. Because then you'd learn how to yeah, I like, play soccer? Yeah, I like the idea of training. Um, Singer-songwriter, huh. down. Right. Um, you know, you don't need an acting career to <laughs> learn and perfect any of these things. I know, but I'm like, how can I get away you'd with like to get paid? perfecting these hobbies and getting paid for them? Wow. That is genius. <laughs> There's great mentoring for people listening. <laughs> when choosing acting roles, right. make sure it involves something you'd like to perfect. I know, and I love that I think that I have the luxury of this choice. <laughs> yeah. I just want to put it out there. <laughs> sure. Well, listen, a big part of acting is making specific choices. Right. <laughs> uh, it just hadn't been presented in such light. <laughs> oh, yeah, and I said witchcraft. I was like, give me a good witchcraft thing. Wow. I've, I've, I said that in a lot of writing meetings because I am very interested in making, like... Meaning my brain goes right to the comedy sketch of Jews as witches and warlocks. <laughs> See, I saw your hat. I saw an alchemy this, and uh -huh. I was like, alchemy, I'm in. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Totally. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that's so funny. Uh, and what do your agents say when you tell them um, you'd like to learn physical <laughs> attributes as part of your acting career trajectory. I actually don't work. I only have my managers. Okay. And they, I think, are just amused by sometimes the things that I come out with. I'm sure. like, look, I'm just trying to be specific. <laughs> well, listen, if you're just trying to be amusing. Right. <laughs> kudos. Well, I think if like. If you're serious. I, 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 I am. I am serious okay. in a lot of ways. I just think that there's too many choices. But for some reason in life, whenever I've been like oddly specific, that's sort of what happens. Well, Les Baum certainly is an example of being oddly specific. Right. <laughs> right. Right? So let's go to the origin story of the short film, which mm -hmm. again was called... Girl Night Stand. That's right. That's correct. I have it written down. Um, so you literally look through your thoughts of finding a hole and a, and a need. Oh, well, I was like, uh, you know, like, is that what's that express? Like scratching our own itch. You know, yep. it's kind of like, I just really was, I needed that. I needed this particular story at a very difficult time in my life. I wanted a comedy that sort of pointed at um, a journey that I was going through that had a happy ending and promised me that, it, you know, it was going to be great at the end of, you know, coming out. Yeah, I'm sure every interview you're doing is asking you if you came out at Thanksgiving. I'm assuming the answer is no. No, the no, the answer is no. Yeah. Um, was it a Tuesday? It wasn't it, even a Thursday. <laughs> might have been a Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> My mom called me out on it, actually. Called you out on um, well, I had I brought a friend to to dinner with my my parents and um she had too many drinks and was looking at me like she was in love with me. She being the girl you my brought. yeah, my my friend. And my mom was like, she just saw it from a mile away. And then that girl broke up with me that night because she couldn't do it. She was like, This is not the life for me. I was like, You I was like, my you've outed me and now and now we're never gonna be together. <laughs> This isn't the life for me. Yeah. Being in a lesbian relationship yeah. is not the life for me. Yeah, my family wouldn't accept it. But I mean there's that scene in that in the movie which right. I've been on both sides of that conversation and you know being the person who was brought home and nobody knew who I was but also being the person who brought someone home and nobody knew. Well, you, your character says something in the film and since you wrote it I'm going to assume it it spoke to a moment that you must have felt. Mm -hmm. Your character says something I've never heard a uh, lesbian 
or anyone from the community with all the letters that you mentioned that I never get right. So I, <laughs> I won't try. Please say it again. I, I say LGBTQ. It's starting to continue, but like I can't That's say That's where you it. cut it yeah, off? Yeah, because I can't go fast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I've never seen this moment in fiction where someone of that community says in discussing their own frustrations and fears to the other person who's encouraging them to come out mm -hmm. and says, no one wants to be gay mm -hmm. or no one wants to feel like yeah, I don't, I don't want to be gay. No one. Yeah. I, the character, I, I say, I don't, I don't want to be gay. No one wants this. No one wants this. Mm. Right. So this, it's a great way to say it. Thankfully you corrected me because <laughs> the way you wrote it and performed it, is, is far more impactful because it opens up a uh, Pandora's box of what is this? Mm -hmm. um, I know it follows, I don't want to be gay, I don't want this. So it, it suggests to be connected to that. But the this of it all is a much bigger mm -hmm. story. And you're having this internal struggle of feelings. Uh, it, who doesn't want follow a easier path mm -hmm. right yeah let's forget the word normal because no one is right <laughs> i don't know why it's in the vernacular uh you must have had those feelings to write that yeah you know and i was actually it, uh, it made me uncomfortable to write and to say and to keep in the movie but um did you I, get notes from people who said well, you shouldn't keep it yeah or it pe made people nervous um I, I think people were afraid that it was going to be taken out of context or if that's how I still felt sure. or, or I thought that, or if I thought that there was something wrong with it, which I don't, it was just that it comes with a set of challenges that even with progress and, you know, more acceptance, though there are people who still have very strong opinions, um, it seemed like you were talking about the president just now. <laughs> Sorry. There, it comes with a set of challenges like there has been i live in jersey city which is a liberal city and i have yet to be able to comfort my wife in public without some guy being like yeah like she was like in tears and this guy walked by and gave a sexual grunt and like i'm like you know and i and Al, i think a lot of it is the way um lesbian characters are often depicted and, and a lot of times there's, it's it's there's gratuitous sex scenes and I don't know. And, and on top of that, like, like there's this one time I'll never forget at like my friend's wedding. If I was filming this, it would be hilarious, but it was us. And my wife was pissed um, where we kissed and then we parted. And in between our heads, there was a guy just staring there and he was like, nice. And I was like, so gross, you know? And like, and it wasn't like, and it, she just pecked me <laughs> like, and it just, like, it just like, yeah. And so I think it just comes with that. And also, like, even getting past, like, all of that, like, I, even, like, with my first dance with her at the wedding, like, I couldn't wrap my head around this idea that there's, like, two women having this first dance because I just, there aren't, the fairy tales don't present it like that. That's right. So we were watching, like, Beauty and the Beast, and I was like, isn't it crazy that I'm like, you know what, Belle and this Beast, so romantic, but, like, us dancing. Yeah, I'm like, that's nah, fine. I'm not. Bestiality is fine. Yeah. And I'm like, but let's not get two chicks together. <laughs> you know, and it's just because like, I haven't seen it a lot. And right. so, um, and that's just like my personal journey. Some people are just like, you know, don't overthink as much as I do. Well, <laughs> but that's all we do. But even like, we're like the whole idea of my, you know, coming out, my mom's like, well, what's going on with grandchildren? Like, what does that mean? Grandchildren. And like, we've started to have this conversation and it's like so much, more scientific than like my young self would have imagined for my future self. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no context in which we're going to like come together. And I keep joking with my mom. I'm like, you know, it's just, it's just going to happen when it happens. And I'm, and I'm just being a smart ass. And then my mom's like, I don't think that's funny. And I'm like, imagine if it was an immaculate conception because that would throw off a whole lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I had, <laughs> I had a technically still have uh, a bit of my act that I bring out around Easter time um, where I, you know, talk to the audience about being a Jew at Easter time and, and how fun that is. And uh, 
Also, if I may, I say, uh, the whole thing is God's plan, right? Um, so you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> we were just doing our part when we called the Italians and said, you got this, right? <laughs> the guy in the woods with the little group of followers, he needs to go. Uh, you'll recognize him. He's like a foot off the ground. Uh, but the, you know, the, the issue of, uh, the Immaculate Conception, I, I, I had my, the most fun of was just, uh, my heart goes out to Joseph because he comes home from busting ass at work to his quote unquote virgin wife. Right. (laughs) And she's what? (laughs) Followed by Who? Really? The Lord <laughs> got there before me. Did he? Oh, <laughs> uh, wow. That's a big swing, honey. You sure you want to stick with that? The Lord is why you're pregnant, not from me? Huh. All right. Oh, that's great. Uh, by the way, honey, I'm also assuming the Lord had his choice of every single woman on the planet. <laughs> And you'd like me to believe <laughs> you're the one. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I digress. Um, but yeah, I mean, those discussions of where is this little miracle going to come from with right. your parents is as crazy. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. Um, so uh, let's go again to the the experience you were having and the notion of I'll do a short film about what myself and a lot of people go through. Well, so like I spent six years trying to, I don't know if you know this, I spent six years trying to attach a director and a star. Did not, did not. <laughs> and this was to a short film? For for Les Bomb. Uh, to the movie? Yeah. Okay. And like I just, it was, I couldn't attach a director or a star and, I, and uh, with no money. And then I kept meeting with directors and they were like, do it yourself because like if you don't have like there's no one that's going to bring enough passion to the project as much passion that as you will mm. to like take it to the finish line on something this low budget you had uh written directed and starred in the short film yeah that became viral yeah or went viral yeah, yeah. and so so when i couldn't attach a uh, a director or star to lesbom and then i was like i guess i'm gonna have to do it myself that short film was like my proof of concept of what that would look like. Mm. And so I took that proof of concept and I put it online, hoping that the numbers would be what they ended up so that I could show investors where the audience was. Not a Kickstarter, but just yeah, launching it. Just dropping it online. Yeah. Give me a little more information on that. Because again, as I was saying before, how do you break through the noise? Well, how do you let anyone find out about your new film, Lesbian, right. let alone a short film Yeah, when YouTube has 17 million of them daily? Right. So who the fuck are you and why am I watching this? <laughs> when you say you dropped it on the internet, what did you literally do? So the first thing I did was I reached out to... Um, her name's Trish Bendix. She's now she is now a writer at Into, and she at the time in 2015 was at After Ellen, and she agreed to because my argument was if it's a short film. I'm not taking it to festivals because in terms of um, we're not that I wasn't holding on to that because in terms of demonstrating audience, you, even if it gets into the biggest festival, I don't know wh- what seats are being filled by people, and having that conversation is still leaves a lot to the imagination. And so I was like, I'll put it online. And I reached out to Trish um, through a friend who introduced us. And then she agreed to premiere it on After Ellen, which is a site that had um, a lot of LGBTQ traffic and an audience built into it. Sure. And so it went on that um, and it was on a Vimeo link. And that Vimeo link had all the press attached to it that got picked up by a few places. But that number, it capped out at about 500,000 views. But people kept ripping it off of my Vimeo and putting it on YouTube. Mm. And then YouTube told me I had to put it on YouTube so that they could flag it for copyright or something. And then I put it on YouTube too. And then that organically like went up to the millions. And then somebody ripped it off of my YouTube and uploaded it to a site in China, translating it to Mandarin. 
And, and, and then I got connected to this blog and I did a Q and a with their audience. I learned how to say something in Mandarin, which I don't remember, but it was like this really interesting experience. Please tell me what you learned to say in Mandarin. It was like, hi, thank you so much. I'll have the number seven. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Uh, Yeah. She was like, oh, and then the craziest, this is the craziest story about all of it. So far it's all crazy, but go ahead. So um, after I wrap, after we finished like with Les Bomb coming out and we had the trailer, I've, I've kept in touch with that blog in China. And so I reached out to the person who uploaded it and she reaches, she emails me back and she's like, Jenna, you'll never believe this. I have my first girlfriend. It's the girl who subtitled your short film and I'm the one who uploaded it. And then we met and now we're dating. Isn't that insane? That's the, maybe, forgive me, the best part of the whole experience. I know, I know. I was like, oh my God, this is incredible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was, it was, I, I, and then my wife was like, see, every time you're down, you remember this email. And I was like, I know. Yeah, truly. Yeah. Much like one of the emails I read earlier. Right. You know, <laughs> these can be life-changing. Um, wow, 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 wow. Yeah. Uh, so everyone's telling you, do the film yourself and you, how do you find Bobby Farrelly? So Girl Night Stand was at ITV Fest, agreed to screen it there, even though it was online, which is great. And I went up to ITV Fest and I had already been connected to Rob Moran and how my cat- he's a producer yeah. and also acts in the film. Yeah. And he, he was on a show called South of Nowhere. That's correct. So he was very familiar that there's a built in audience. It's very hungry for content. He was like, people are going to get behind this. And he had already agreed to produce the film. And I was up at ITV Fest with Girl Night Stand and Bobby was at ITV Fest and he saw the short and I had reached out to Rob and I was like, Bobby Farrelly's here. And he got us together and we chatted and had dinner and I told him about Les Bomb and he read the script. Crazy. Yeah, it was, yeah, I, there was a lot of um, miracles along this. Yeah, I mean, those of you listening, that what was just described doesn't happen. <laughs> really. I mean, the guy that cleans the pool has a script. <laughs> right. <laughs> and he, he would really like me to read it. <laughs> and for eight years now, I've managed to avoid reading his script. <laughs> because I, there's no time. Yeah. I mean, there are people I care greatly about. Um who also have a script. Right. And yeah. One thing I did that I thought was, was helpful to get people to read the script. Cause I was like, you know what? I have a theory that no one's reading anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> They're just giving feedback. Yeah. And I was like, I'm just going to, I, so I spent the, this one <laughs> Christmas month, like just pulling scenes from my favorite movies that tonally felt right. And telling the story through a five minute short with all of these clips. Well, that's, Kind of brilliant, and we shouldn't race past it. Right. Um, this movie I'm allegedly directing in January. Um, early on, my Academy Award nominated brilliant producer said, you should put together like a lookbook to really let agents know what, what you see for this. Mm. And I not being as um, adventurous and insightful as you said, Julie, you're producing the movie because you read the script and loved it. So how is that not enough? <laughs> I need to show people what it's going to look like. Right. Because when we met after you read the script, you said, I know exactly what this looks like mm-hmm. from reading the script. Because I was so specific in the stage direction. Because I, I didn't write it to direct it. I, I wrote it so that another director couldn't fuck it up. <laughs> <laughs> and it became very stylized with these transitions that are in the stage direction and using the camera as that. And I... I uh, I wasn't being precious with it, and I wasn't being annoying with it. I was really trying to let the reader visualize what I saw. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I I wasn't as um, professional to rise to the challenge of doing what you just talked about doing it. And you just figured that out on your own or someone gave you that heads up or you learned from editing 35 hours of your friends in college or high school, sorry, yeah. into a five minute thing to show at your premiere at home. I, well, I knew how to edit because, well, 
uh, I had learned over the years. No, I, not just know yeah, how to yeah, edit. Yeah. I mean, literally, I'm going to make oh the sizzle thing a presentation based on other films. Right. I had seen one example of I don't remember where I saw it, but I saw somebody had I saw in uh, some video where someone had done that, and I was like, "That's brilliant! I should do that." Well, apparently, everyone does it, but me. No. <laughs> so I know they're out there, but for you personally, yeah, you had seen one and I you saw- thought, "Oh, I should do that." I just, yeah, I, and even like in my experience in the past, like when I was coming out here for the first time and like taking meetings and trying to get people to read anything, it it was, if I had that content on the web and they could hit play, it was really the only time that they invest in time to read. Sure. And so I felt like it would be the same thing with the script is like, if I just have something that they can hit play while they're having a snack or on their break, then maybe they'll invest however ta- much time it takes especially just five minutes worth yeah instead of taking an hour and a half or more to read yeah exactly yeah because i nobody has any time like everybody's like oh can you give give can you can you send your my script to your manager i'm mm-hmm. like i would love to but nobody has time to read anything <laughs> it's just I <it's> like <laughs> it's unbelievable yeah <laughs> no i'm texting with an actor who i've known for a long time who allegedly is a dear friend and I'm saying, do I need to have my producer call your fucking agent and make an offer for you to read this? What's the matter with you? Mm-hmm. You know, and he's just apologizing and and um, with all sincerity, you know, then busting my balls about my needs. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no one has any time to read anything, right? Yeah, and like I also was in like I had to do everything to make this project happen because I like nobody knows me in any context. Right. So it's like, well, I really have to go for it to make it happen because no one gives a crap <laughs> about me. Right. You know? Sure. So uh, there were a lot of, I could, there could be no loose ends. It's a visual calling card. It's a great, great tool. Yeah. And I'm a tool for not have, having done it myself. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure it's why this actor friend of mine is not texting me. Um, wow. So, when you finally sit down, is it Bobby Farrelly that helps push things along in terms of turning your we, script into a movie? Well, he – so he gave – I the script is pretty close to what we shot, um, but the he gave notes on the – his primary notes, which I'm so grateful for, were the opening scene, mm. which was like the biggest lesson on this whole – like one of the biggest lessons on this whole journey because – uh, my opening scene had felt very indie. Like there was like like there was like a sex there was like a sex scene sort of, but it was like in a bathroom, and I was like, "This is cool." But As, that was in the short. In in actually in the feature. Right, but wasn't yeah in the a short, version of that. Yeah, but the short is like a one night stand. Right. But in the feature, I was trying to take that and like carry it over, and then the opening scene would be that. But like tonally, that would have. Like the whole reason I made my movie was so that audiences could very comfortably sit around a couch as a family after Thanksgiving and watch the movie. And so he's like, you don't want to offset them in that opening scene. And I was like, oh, my God, you're absolutely right. And like he was like echoing. You want me to watch a sex scene with my grandmother? (laughs) Why would you? (laughs) And like I, I... like he he like I had said that, but also I was sort of getting this whole thing where it has to be more indie, has to be more indie, and I'm like glad that I listened to him. Sure. <laughs> yeah, and you had to open up the story and, and like get a, to know the people. Yeah, in a very accessible, right. like open way. Yeah. Right, which now makes more sense to you. A hundred percent. Yeah, it is sort of funny how myopic we can be as writers, um, because. It's so crystal clear why what we're thinking is perfect is perfect. And then someone says that and you go, oh, huh. It is weird how objective or fresh eyes, as they're called. Oh, yeah. Changes everything. For sure. Yeah. And when, so he, when he came on, um, he came like, you know, slowly, but trick, uh, slowly, but surely I tricked him into being, you know, but he, no, he seriously, he had so much support, mm. um, for the project and it, the subject matter was meaningful to him because, uh, well, his daughter, um, has come out and her journey, the dialogue that we had had over that dinner was he, it sparked a conversation with them 
And then he hadn't realized that maybe she had felt like that at any moment. And he's like, of course. And she's like, of course I felt like that. And so I think because it created an interesting conversation with them, he he thought that there was a powerful message behind the film that other people might respond to and hopefully it could, you know, encourage some change where it's needed. Mm. Um, so yeah, that was an incredible conversation at dinner. And he and the producer you mentioned, Rob Moran, then help you find the money to make it. Yes. Right. And it's not a lot of money. Right. Um, it's enough to make the film. Mm-hmm. In 15 days? 15 days. I'm always like 15 days, three pickups, and two blizzards. <laughs> yeah. And then you have to go about casting it. Right. And according to People Magazine, the film stars Bruce Dern. Yes. Uh, about a lesbian coming out at Thanksgiving. Yeah. The People headline, lesbian holiday rom-com starring Bruce Dern. I was like, he was the biggest lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how offensive would that be to Cloris Leachman? Yeah. <laughs> let alone me. I was just like, this is so funny. And I'm, I'm always interested with the headline, like what the, and I'm like, well, it is catchy, you know? <laughs> yeah. I wrote a movie for Tim Allen uh, that we sold to Disney that they never made. But when I wrote it <laughs> and the announcement, of the trades came, the announcement, which I framed and is in my office says, Pollock nabs cheese. <laughs> because again, it was for Disney. <laughs> Disney's. Poster boy is a mouse. You're right. That is Pollock Nabs cheese. <laughs> what, a, what a perfect, redonkulous show business thing to write. <sighs> That's <Yeah>. so great. <laughs> yeah. Um. So then you you let's go to the casting. Yeah, the casting was so hard, so hard. Yeah. Because we couldn't get the script into any cast hands. Right. It just wasn't happening, and then um, and then we were able to get it in your hands. You had no one before me? That's not possible. So we had a tentative, we had like a tentative something. And we had done an announcement, but it was like with, with A.B. Um, and Brandon Michael Hall. But that was before he did The Mayor, God Friended Me. Um, Caitlin Maynor, who plays my girlfriend. And then Elaine Hendricks, I believe she was on it or was interested at that point. But like we, but nothing was like we hadn't like kicked things into to gear. You certainly didn't have any names that were going to relax the sphincters of the finance. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's a good way to put it. That's the way I like to put yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, it's a visual meeting. <laughs> uh, so before you get Bruce Dern or Cloris Leachman yeah. or the goot. Yeah. No, it was you, you, it was your yes. That really, um, as right. they kept saying, move the needle. And how did we get to me? So I'm trying to remember one of my producers, Ryan, Oh, he Ryan. knew your agent, right? And then the agent looked away from the budget and gave you the script. <laughs> <laughs> it is always great to hear that an agent who lives for commissions, right, um, can suggest their client if there are other things to be reading, right? <laughs> read the one that no one's getting paid, right? It really is, yeah. Um, but listen. Uh, it happened on The Usual Suspects. There was no money. We got paid coffee and donuts. I mean, that movie was made for around $5 million, which is a shit ton of movie and money in real life and certainly right. a shit ton of money compared to what you had to work with. Right. But in the indie world of 1994, that was coffee and donuts for the actors, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, and my agent kept telling me about this script, and I said, well, who's in it? There were no names that were name names. <laughs> right. Who's directing it? The writer and director are 25. You've never heard of them. <laughs> Honestly. And I said, well, what else is going on? Right. What other script should we talk about? And he kept saying, you got to read this. And kept circling back to it. Oh, that's so wonderful to hear. But that's also the deal. It never changes. Right. Yeah. It, I mean, it was because ch- we had no money. So it's like, how how do we get people to read the script? It was just... I mean, getting that phone call from you was like life changing. It really was, and um, and I've never heard that before. By the way, yeah, that's nice to hear. Yeah, it really was. It was like uh, what's one of like the the memories that's so nearest and dearest to my heart because I my wife had gone to sleep because um, it was L.A. time, so you called me at nine p.m. L.A. time. Oh, that's right. And- <laughs> 
<laughs> and I, I did the reverse I, of everyone's mother. I thought it was like nine. I guess he, I was like, I guess he's not calling because it's like 9 p.m. And I'm just like waiting and waiting. And then the phone rings at like um, promptly at midnight. And so I'm, I was hiding in my office to be quiet because my wife Anya was sleeping. And it was made unclear to me. I just want the listeners to know that 9 p.m. <laughs> East Coast time was when I was supposed to call. That was not me waiting three hours past my window of opportunity. I'm going to sweat this kid. Yeah. Um, and then and then we just well, we just chatted and it was really nice to hear about your experience having directed the movie um, Late Bloomers, right? Late Bloomer, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And um, and just hearing about that and then I had just watched Usual Suspects. <laughs> just watching it again. And I was like, get, I was getting in like the Kevin Pollack mind frame. I was like, getting myself geared up for that call. Yeah. Yeah. Cause the character I played in the suspects was certainly very, very similar to the one I played in your film. <laughs> Spot on. My favorite, my favorite, one of my favorite memories, not one of my favorite part of the experience was, um, my birthday is, it just happened. It's, uh, ha Halloween Eve mm. and, um, happy birthday. Yeah. Thanks. It's so great to be old. Uh, I kind of. <laughs> finally embraced that I'm going to let myself go from the end of October till the end of the year. Mm -hmm. I'm going to eat whatever the fuck I want, and I'm probably going to gain 10 pounds. <laughs> and for a little guy, that's a lot of weight. So also in about six weeks. <laughs> uh, and you, they said uh, the wardrobe fitting uh, is, you know, in this hotel room. I go to the wardrobe fitting, and... <laughs> I guess this wasn't clear to me when I read the script. <laughs> Wardrobe fitting was sweatpants and a sweatshirt. <laughs> and I thought, oh, man, this is the perfect job for me. <laughs> and when I saw the movie the other night at that little screening in New York, all I saw was this big, fat pumpkin head of mine <laughs> on top of a sweatpants and shirt thinking, you idiot. <laughs> Why would you do? Anyways, um, so we had the conversation at 9 p.m. my time. Uh, your 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 life was allegedly uh, uh, made slightly easier in that you had any name from real show business yeah. that agents would then say who represent the Cloris Leachmans and the right um, others that you were able to get. Bruce Stern, yeah, who stars in the film. Yeah, I mean, they came quickly after you. But I needed you for someone. Yeah, I needed, any yeah. any recognizable name from show business. <laughs> yeah, but I mean the like that. I mean, you play my dad. I mean, my dad and my mom. The two roles were so important to me about who play who played them because right. I would never hear the end of it if my parents didn't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could have gotten Stephen Baldwin. That, that might have <laughs> moved somebody's needle, but. <laughs> yeah. No, I was so excited that you came on board, and and then I think it was Cloris came on board, and then I found out that Bruce was like, "Who is this about me?" And then they sent him Girl Night Stand, which apparently he liked. He liked yeah. the short film, so yeah. I I didn't know that until after the fact. And that was after Nebraska. Yeah. So he was. It was like the right after the year after, yeah. 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 Just in terms of every now and then they celebrate someone as they go closer to 80 years old, mm. you know, and some magical role comes their way and it reinvents uh, what they do and what they're capable of mm -hmm. or helps people to remember what the fuck they're capable of. Right. right? Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Anyways, <laughs> um, so he, while we were shooting, was 80 and Cloris was 90? She was, um, he was in his... 80s and Cloris, I know, was 90. Because are you? Can you kind of curse on this? Am I allowed to say? This? I think I've been cursing. Okay, great. Because yeah. she kept in between takes putting that pink lipstick on. I mean, she kept going, "I'm nine fucking T." And I was like, "Well, I know your age." <laughs> so, <laughs> that's how you remember. Yeah, that's how. I, and so people are like, "How old is Cloris?" I'm like, "How well, when to be shoot?" Okay, she's 91 now. <laughs> you know, 92. <laughs> right. Yeah, she did not suffer fools. Yeah. Uh, I remember. The moment it was a very large man standing over her who was either a PA or an intern. <laughs> the AD. The AD. The AD. The one that she was yelling at with the, the... The one who said, "Can is there anything I can do for you? Okay. And she said, you could skip a meal. Yeah. Yeah. Something to that effect. Yeah. 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 She... Um, who was over uh, She was a firecracker. <laughs> 
the sweetest way to put that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kept me on my toes. Yeah. Yeah. She was really though, because as much as she as she gave some people a hard time, she was like really had my back. Mm. Um ex- but like always wanted my hair out of my face. She kept telling you? Yeah, she kept coming, sweetie, sweetie. And then she'd brush the hair out of my face. And then I was like so happy when that attention went to Caitlin. And then I wasn't like and then I didn't have to deal with that. <laughs> But she was also sort of looking after you when she was oh, brushing the hair from your face. For sure. Yeah. She was like I mean it's all I've been thinking since you sat down. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. but I mean that yeah, is yeah. pretty great. Yeah, she was like I I mean I had that moment when she came on set. So I actually sat next to her um years ago at a play and I was just like I would I, I hope one day I get the chance to work with Cloris Leachman. Holy crap. And so when she walked on to set, I was like, I can't believe this moment is here. Yeah. Yeah. She's given some of the most um, historical performances in Mel Brooks' canon. Right. Alone. Just that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A- and 15 days to make a movie with a tiny budget in snowy cold Oh my God. Jersey. Oh man. That way, no, it was crazy. Yeah. We shot in your actual house. My actual house. That you grew up in. Mm hmm. Um, and was that ever not a good thing? Well, yeah, because I wanted my parents to stay away <laughs> for the shoot. And that lasted an hour, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think an hour. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Whose room was my dressing room? Uh, my brother's. Uh-huh. And Bruce Dern had my childhood bedroom. So Nothing wrong with that. It was... Not weird. <laughs> no. <laughs> the best thing about Bruce, though, is like... I'm guessing it never quite smelled like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my first assumption. Yeah. He, he would always, like, bestow wisdom on me. Sure. Like, he'd pull me aside, but, like, no matter what he said, it... It, the tone of it was terrifying, but the words were sweet. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great description of him. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I felt as well, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And I was not a young man. And he would, he would get like, like angsty, bef- like if he was sitting around. So then he'd start wandering the house. So like I'd have the walkie and I'd have to be like, Bruce is on the loose. Like, like he's in a shot. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Bruce is on the loose over the walkie. Yeah. I never heard that. <laughs> Thank goodness. I might not have known what that meant. That's got to be code for something I would have said. Um, all right. Now tell people where they can find the film. I mentioned November 9th. Yes. That is what? So we open in theaters and on demand November 9th. Which theaters? Um, if you go to lesbomovie.com, yep. there's a screenings and events and a link to all the theaters and all the cities. We're in about, I think, 14, 15 cities. Which is just phenomenal to have an actual theatrical release. Congratulations. Thank it's you. It's one of the hardest things for independent films to get. It truly is. Right. In fact, you mentioned Late Bloomer. You know, uh, Netflix bought the film, put it in profit, mm-hmm. which is all the financiers cared about. Right. No one cared about a theatrical release. Um, as much as I did. Yeah. Uh, and it's heartbreaking. You talk about not getting into the festival. How right. about fucking theaters? Right. So it seems um, like every year there's more of a glut of independent films. Mm-hmm. But it also seems like it's never been more difficult to get a theatrical release. Yeah, it it, it does feel like um, I I do feel grateful like yeah. a, like a golden like a golden ticket like um, I feel like that I found a golden ticket. Yeah, regardless of what comes from it, you right. know, again, not being goal, just goal oriented. Of course, as part of the journey, that's a phenomenal aspect. <laughs> so that happens on November 9th. Mm-hmm. Lesbommovie dot com. Yeah, tells people the, com, yeah. the cities mm-hmm. and also links to the video on demand or instructs you on how to find it video on demand. Oh, yeah. My distributor loves when I tell people to pre order the film. They're telling me. So to, do that. So do that, please. <laughs> Where do they pre order the film? Um, on iTunes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then when on the 9th, it'll be available on all those, like the cable providers and Google Play and all of that, but I'm more interested in showing up to the theater where we can all laugh together. Yes. That experience that I talked about at the top Mm -hmm. um, of seeing anything you were a part of with a live audience. I mean, how often are, because everybody's so, their eyes are so glued to their own screen 
and it, and like being in a theater experience is the one time a bunch of people can come together and share one screen. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and it's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, even if it's the one in your house. Right. It's bigger than the one you're holding. Of course. Yeah. Um, so everyone, uh, check out lesbommovie.com. Get more information um, over this holiday season. Let this be the movie that everyone's talking about. And do all you can to get the word out should you enjoy the film. Um, write to us at kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. Let us know about your lesbom movie experience so that I can share it with our filmmaker guest today. Um, we've re reached the point in the show that was spoken about earlier called Ask Kevin, where you get to ask me any question. It can be silly or sincere, mm -hmm. meaningful or meaningless. Okay. You get one question. Oh, I would like to know in like the course of your career, mm -hmm. I mean, you sort of answered it before where something good came out of something bad, but I'd like, like, or you thought it was the end of the world, but then you, something else totally cracked open. Yeah. The honeymoon in Las Vegas come a few good men is certainly the apex of those experiences, but it never ends. Yeah. They're, they're through the history of whatever it is I've done, there's been these brutal letdowns. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a recent one would be the, you know, the TV show Mom is now in its sixth season. And I was asked in the middle of season one to uh, join the circus as Anna Ferris character's long lost father and Allison Janney's former boyfriend who knocked her up when she was a kid, 18, 19. Um, and I was asked to do a couple of episodes of that. And I said, sure, you know. And it was incredibly fun. And then it just kept going. And I ended up doing, I think, 15 to season one and two. And then Chuck Lorre decided to kill my character because that's what you do in sitcoms. Mm -hmm. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and it was so fucking devastating because I wasn't a series regular. I was just having fun mm -hmm. on this show. And also, <laughs> no one kills people in sitcoms. Right. It's, not, it's not, <laughs> not what it's about. Uh, but it was a super fun job mm. and super fun creatively f for, in terms of being with the other actors. In terms of working with him, it was not super fun. Um, uh, and, but the end of that was certainly an end of a life that I was enjoying. Mm -hmm. And that led to, um, a short lived series on the same network that I enjoyed doing, but I got to meet Jane Lynch and work with her and also Kyle Bornheimer and Maggie Lawson, who I love dearly. Um, and people had sort of rediscovered that I'm of comedy. You know, I, I had this weird left-hand turn in movies. And kind of 94, 95 was, you know, just Usual Suspects and Casino coming out two years after A Few Good Men. It was over. I was a dramatic actor. That was right. just it. Yeah, yeah. And so this weird resurgence sort of happened um, now, what, five, six years ago. But had I remained on Mom, which is a show that I, like I said, creatively liked working with the other people, but it wasn't a show I was watching and it wasn't a show anyone I knew was watching and, and um, you know, it was a hit. So there was a big number watching it, just not people I knew and, <laughs> dare I say, respected. Uh, you know, it was a CBS sitcom, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It, it, and it does its best to have pathos, and on occasion it does. Mm -hmm. But it was still a CBS sitcom. And it gave way to this Marvelous Mrs. Maisel job, which is something I hadn't been challenged as a actor maybe ever. Right. In terms of the workload and the way that show is done and eight-page wonders that I have to memorize like a play. And also my, you know, I've, I've, I've joked, including the title of the book, How I Slept My Way to the Middle. But the truth is, as a character actor, I'm in a big scene with Tom Cruise, whoever the giant movie star is that I'm in with. And if there's a seven or eight page scene, it starts with my character saying to the movie star, so what do you think we should do? Right. And then eight pages later, I say, all right, let's go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know. <laughs> right, right. So to be in a show where my character is a blowhard yeah. and he just talks, he doesn't listen. So a page of dialogue will be, you know, like a four inch section of me talking and then a half an inch section of whoever the other character is, and then me again for four inches of dialogue. I would just, I don't know that that's ever happened in terms of a regular job. Right. So just on that standpoint, um, on top of all the accolades and breaking into the zeitgeist and whatever else success the show has had, mm -hmm. just me personally, all I had to do was turn 60, I like to tell people. <laughs> and this weird, bizarre opportunity came up, but it would not have been available to me if that other devastating loss mm -hmm. hadn't occurred. Right. Which at the time, all I thought was, but what if the show goes on to last five or six or more years and I'm not on it anymore? What's that going to feel like? Yeah. Well, it feels pretty fucking amazing. Yeah, I was going to say, it feels pretty good. <laughs> it felt great at the Emmys <laughs> yeah. when I saw my dear friend Alice and Jenny not win <laughs> and the star of our show win. Um Rachel Brosnahan, who's so damn brilliant. Uh, so there, maybe that's the new example. Much longer. Sorry. No, I thank you for sharing that. Um, and now it's time for Kevin's pop quiz. Sure. Between 5 and 15 points available for each of the following three questions. And once the final score is tabulated, it'll be posted on our website along with the current standing of the top 100. Are you ready? Yeah. Question number one. Keith David or David Keith? What? Yep, that's correct. <laughs> Question number two. Carl Weathers or the weather in Carlsbad? Carl Weathers? Correct. And last question, Steve? Mm hmm <laughs> That's a perfect <laughs> score. Sam, Sam's applauding <laughs> behind the glass here at Airwolf in the fancy studios. The, the, Sam was always sitting at the edge of the table <laughs> these last many years, and now he's in his own booth, and he is applauding. <laughs> the success of my guest today Jenna Lorenzo, thank you, and congratulations on your film. Thank you, Kevin. I'm so unbelievably excited. I appreciate that. Truly. Um, I wish you a, a wonderful holiday season, <laughs> both personally and professionally. Thank you. You too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that's our show. That's our guest. Write to us again, kpcsfanmail at gmail.com. I want to thank Sam, everyone's favorite engineer, uh, for once again, although I'm not enjoying the separation and the glass. Just not digging it. Uh, it feels more professional. So I'll have to embrace that. And everyone here at Airwolf uh, for allowing us to continue to do the Kevin Pollock's chat show from these auspices. Sammy and Jamie, not with us. Uh, thank you for emails asking, yeah, what the fuck? Uh, the show will be 10 years old in March. And for the first nine and a half years, <laughs> it was me, Sammy, and Jamie uh, and uh, on video. And people are writing saying, what happened? And um, I'm too fucking busy, man. I'm just going to tell you, I'm too fucking busy. I, I do miss doing the video. Um, I miss evil Dr. Chen, the greatest floor director the world's ever known, as well as all the people involved in that uh, portion. And uh, go to kevinpollock.tv to find the archives or YouTube um, if you dare. Thanks to Corey Levin in post. Uh, until next time, and as always, get out of my face. <laughs>